Hello and welcome to Movies and Tea. I'm your host, as always, Edward Jones, and joining me, of course, is our own little mermaid, Miss Kim Lowe. Hello. Tonight we are nearing the almost the end of our journey through the Miyazaki filmography, as tonight we come to Ponyo um, from 2008, which sees Miyazaki doing another adaptation, uh, this time on Hans Christian's The Little Mermaid, um, with the tale of the little girl who lives underwater, known as Broomhild, who uh, escapes into the, the escapes to the land above water where she makes friends with a young boy um, all the while seeking her leaving her father Fujimoto the once human wizard who's uh, been tasked with keeping the balance in the world of the oceans um, trying to track her down again Kim uh, Ponyo it's not one that anyone really talks about when they talk about either Mozaki's films or the world of uh, Studio Ghibli really but um, what's your sort of thoughts on Ponyo really is it one of your favourites or is it sort of way down the list when it comes to like ranking these movies it's definitely a lot lower on my list Um, I mean don't get me wrong there is still a lot of charm that's in it but um, and and basically like when you think about it being uh, Miyazaki's take on The Little Mermaid there's you know, there's definitely an appeal to the whole situation that's going on here. And and yet somehow Ponyo is seems to be forgotten and not really seen by a lot of people, I think, and doesn't really make a big splash, I guess, <laughs> um, as a whole. Um, there are some really cute moments, obviously. Um, I feel like a movie like this is more like maybe it's more geared towards younger audience. I'm not sure. Um, cause I mean, just if you look at it, this is definitely a film in his filmography where the characters are much younger. Um, the last time we saw this was what my neighbor Totoro, which also had a young girl, but everything else, you know, everyone is definitely a little bit more mature, a little bit older. Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, certainly with when we're looking at this era of Studio Ghibli, I mean, this is really when they're entered into their independent era. So, for between 1999 and 2005, Ghibli was a subsidiary band of uh, Tokuma Sultan. However, the partnership ends in around April 2005, and they were sort of spun off and established, re-established as an independent company uh, with their own sort of headquarters. And it's in this era that we start we see films such as like Tales from Earthsea, um tell princess uh keiji yuta um and obviously mirazaki decides at this point he's going to also retire um and comes to sort of like his final films really been obviously he's since changed his mind on said uh retirement but with this film it's in many ways it feels like a return to uh, the more sort of whimsical side of his work and in many ways it feels like almost like a throwback to uh, My Name of Totoro because when we look at his filmography obviously he, he does Cast in the Sky, does My Name of Totoro and then he goes off this more sort of fantastical edge where he's doing things such as like Kiki's Livery Service, Princess Mononoke um, these sort of like grown up fantasies and certainly with Ponyo it feels like a return to doing something like My Neighbor Totoro, um, a sort of low threat movie that sort of heavily steeps in fantasy and the risks are sort of low for, low for out and I think this is certainly where, where Ponyo falls is you look at the stakes in this movie and they're never like anything that we see in sort of like the likes of Howl's Moving Castle or certainly not in the certainly uh, with uh, Princess Mononoke, even though we see a lot of the familiar themes that that we've seen throughout Miyazaki's filmography, such as his love of environmentalism, and even his use of underwater vehicles seem more designed around um, like vehicles that we've seen him have as flying vehicles, but now they're obviously underwater, which he treats exactly the same as if they were like just flying in the sky. So it's kind of fun to see how he adapts to just underwater rather than having uh, the obvious the obvious things that he can just put in the sky. 
when you think about like the underworld here, it, it's it's obviously there there is the whole balance of nature, and you have his interpretation of something like the tsunami that hits them when the nature is you know out of balance and out of whack and the main issue is obviously ponyo coming into the life of everybody um and her seeming to have direct influence of how you know calm or not calm everything is outside at the beginning when she first uh, le- uh ends up uh on land uh, but, you know, when we see the tsunami hit and um, basically the whole rainstorm just blows everything out of proportion in a sense where everything is underwater at this point, um, you start seeing all these like, I think that that's one of the things that's so fascinating and charming is when we get to the point where you start seeing those little details of what's underwater and all those um all the creatures that are down there because you're, yeah. you're talking about the ancient sea creatures that have all come out and you know ponyo being having lived with uh fujimoto because it's her it's her dad obviously um she starts she recognizes all these creatures that uh everybody thinks is gone <laughs> um it's very similar to the Meg, isn't it? It's yeah. <laughs> sort of like these these things have been existing somewhere. They've just, uh, as I said, been, and when we get to the tsunami sequence, like tw- in the sort of f- third quarter of the film, and then they all start reappearing, and it's almost like the oceans have reclaimed the earth again. Um, and certainly when you see the fish and the swimming along like roads and stuff, I thought that's really kind of charming. And in many ways, just uh, from like a gaming ref- reference, it feels it felt so much like um, I was playing Ozu again. Oh, uh, Abzu, yeah. Abzu, sorry. Um, just as soon as those, um, when you see like the serenity of like just watching these prehistoric fish swim around and stuff, it was like as it was like just playing that game again. So I was looking at our hero in this one, uh, which is. A young boy called uh, Sosuke, who's supposed to be five years old, but he's actually a lot more feels a lot older than that when we look at the film. And he's uh, finds Ponyo in a in a lava stage. So when we look at uh, her character, I felt that her evolution is kind of like a frog. So she starts off as like a tadpole, and then she, when you look at her evolving, she develops a more like frog face, and later on she grows arms and as she's uh evolves to be a little human girl and it's kind of an adorable really when she starts off in this tiny stage she just uh this like tapo mm-hmm. tapo who likes ham you know i can associate with it is a really sort of charming little friendship that we've seen between between ponyo and uh sosuke and he's an only child he lives with his mother and his uh father is um works on a fishing troll fishing troll yeah. i want to say i couldn't quite figure out what her, his dad did um i know that he likes to signal back and forth using the um the signaling light that they have at the house uh which has a great sequence where um his mother's fallen out with his father and uh, she just starts having an argument with him using the light mm-hmm. calling him idiot 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 oh i think it's boku baka, 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 i think baka. it's <laughs> Which is just great. It's kind of fun to see Murasaki doing stuff with, as I said, with underwater vehicles and ships rather than um, just more flying vehicles as we've seen. Even though there's a sequence at the during the finale, he basically crams the sky with as many flying vehicles as he can. Which I think, assume is the only reason he had a tsunami at the end is just so he could like put helicopters and planes in the sky and just have it really as crowded as he wants. So. But seeing um, how he draws, he has uh, the ships and he has them with like the Christmas lights that they always seem to light up with. I thought was just there's just so much detail in this film that it's just so beautiful to look at. And when we look at the underwater layer of uh, Ponyo's father, uh, Fujimoto, and there's sequences where um, where all the uh, crabs are like climbing coming in for the window because they're just water that's held back through magic so you have all these hundreds of crabs that are just crawling in for the window and uh trying to steal his stuff which i thought was kind of fun as well so <laughs> yeah well there's a lot of little fun moments i think uh and even when you think about like certain uh character designs and even like layouts and stuff like that when you look at his layer it almost looks like um uh nausicaa's lair when she has that little 
garden that she has that she she has hidden yeah. to figure out the water and the air and all that. And then, you know, when you look at some of the character designs, like um, Fujimoto. Fujimoto actually looks a lot like, uh, I think he looks a lot like Howl when he's, like, really in his very angry phase when he's, like, pulling that tantrum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have, um, obviously we're not there yet, but the the young couple live in, meet in, the, in a boat uh, uh, in, in near the end. Uh, they actually look... A lot like um, the when the main characters of Wind Rises. I don't know if it's just me, but I mean, obviously we're not there yet, <laughs> and, and, and no. I don't know if you've watched it yet. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of things here that uh, definitely is pretty fun to watch. Like, there's all these little details. I think one of the big ones. I think that when you th when you think about reality and and um and fantasy mixed together is when you have that ship graveyard where everything's just like at one area they're all just stacked up together yeah. and it almost feels like like in this world the 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 i don't know are the boats beached are they you know like w what's going on here you know like it's it's very it's it's just uh it's just crazy because you're watching all of this and they almost look like they're floating in the air because of the animation but they're not because they're they're all just stacked up to each other. And I think that that scene ha is like when you first see it, it's it's really really cool that that that, that you even thought about doing that. Is this the scene where Grandma Mare turns up uh, Ponyo's mother, and he sees in the distance all the boats? Is that the scene you're talking about? No, I mean like uh, I mean the dad. Uh, the dad they're looking up from the boat or something, and then the, and then they're looking. Oh yeah, right. And then they're like they're yeah. like oh they think that they're at a city. But then they look at it, and it's like, oh, no, it's not a harbor. It's not, you know, anything. It's just, like, a ship graveyard. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know there's that uh, scene later on where uh, um, his his dad's boat uh, stalls because um, Grandma Mary Ponyo's mother turns up, and she's this huge water spirit. I, I'd still get myself a headache trying to figure out the logistics of how Fujimoto and Grandma Mary had a relationship. Because she is gigantic and he is just normal human size, so <laughs> the logistics of their relationship just kind of gave me a headache. There, it, it, again, it's just one of those wonderful scenes when you see her turn up and she's like almost like this uh, giant whale type figure. The way that she sort of glides through mm -hmm. the water and you see, you see this, this almost like a reflection underneath, and they the sailors believe that she's like this uh, goddess of mercy because she spares them from the storm and. Even when we uh, get when we see like the flooded village because um, of the water rising up, and you see like the boats that have been tethered, the rising, the sort of like held up by the ropes, but they're sort of like suspended midair. It's a lot of really interesting visuals there that I was not expecting to get from this movie because of it being so whimsical. But at the same time, it doesn't limit Murasaki's vision in the slightest. It still has this eye for detail and the eye for sort of world building. And even like right from the start, you kind of know where everything is in this village they're in. The fact that they've got this dry dock that they have to go through to get to the retirement home where his mother works and is right next to the school where he goes to. And um, the fact that he has like this relationship with all the residents of the old folks home where they're all like this, they're all essentially a bunch of grandmas to him. Which I thought was kind of adorable as well. So, yeah, and and then I mean, not to mention, I mean, like when you think about the grandmas, like just thinking about. Um, obviously, I watch this in English dub because I don't have time to read mm. subtitles. <laughs> um, but same as myself, I was just like, I just with these ones, you they put such effort into the dubs. It seems like yeah, and and when you when you think about like the English dub here, <laughs> even the grandmas who have like what two scenes. You have, you know, one the main grandma Yoshi, who is voiced by Betty White, and then the other grumpy one is yes. voiced by Lily Tomlin, and and I think that you know when you just look at the cast itself, even down to the supporting um, characters, it has like such a strong cast, and it it's it's pretty survive sur like surprising for for a film like this, which which you know surprisingly hasn't caught on as much as the other ones, just based on the the the. The voice cast itself. Looking at the voice cast here, Ponyo is uh, voiced by Noah Cyrus. So, if you watch a lot of Disney, um, then you know her because she was on Hannah Montana and Doc. 
uh, Frankie Jonas um, is uh, Sosuke. Tina Fey voices the mother, and um, Kochi is uh, voiced by Matt Damon. Um, oh, that's the father, isn't it? Kochi yeah, yeah. is. Kate Blanchett is Grandmama, so Ponyo's mother, and Fujimoto is Liam Neeson, who's accent is actually pretty well disguised there's parts of it where it's sort of like stands and it's like oh that's Liam Nielsen and other parts where you're not sure who it is so for someone with such a, a, a broad Irish accent it's kind of, <laughs> kind of impressive we managed to hide it so well but uh, yeah as you mentioned you've got Lily Tomlin and Betty White and Cloris Leachman as well as one of the uh, the elder mm-hmm. elderly ones uh, was uh, Ikkyo Yano um does the voice of Ponyo's sisters in both the English and the Japanese version? <laughs> it's not exactly a really. Uh, it's not like actual words to it, right? So <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's, but then again, I mean, you you look at the same actress has been doing the voice of Pikachu for twenty years, and the fact that all she has to do is just variations of Pikachu. <laughs> it's like there's there's three three versions of Pikachu really. There's there's Pikachu. And then there's Pika Pika, and then there's uh, the scared Pika, which I can't get my voice that high, so yeah. you can do that one yourself. But <laughs> and you think, God, someone's been doing this for twenty years. They've just been basically cashing in, just like <laughs> on the most easiest voice work going. Yeah, that that's we're in the wrong business here, clearly. <laughs> yeah, but it's like it's like you know. I remember watching a an interview about uh, what was it. Who who is it that is um who does Groot? Uh, oh, Vin, Vin Diesel. Diesel, right? And and then it's just like <laughs> the different versions that he had to do, type of thing. And it's like, oh, you know, like, and I th- I always think that that's that's also the same thing, right? You you have like how many versions of I am Groot can you have before? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it, it has to seem like it's different every single time, a little bit varied to to make it sound like you know he's trying to emphasize something else or say something else, and you know yeah. <laughs> it is kind of amazing how you can just like put it put use just the same three words and have it mean so so much really. So, but yeah, he did it all the different languages. I remember seeing the video of him like doing it. In, this is Iron Groot in Japanese and Russian. <laughs> Um, but as we uh, said at the start, I mean, there is no real threat a- at all with this this movie. There's no, I mean, it could be argued there is a villain, obviously with Fujimoto. But I think for myself, when it comes to Fujimoto, I think this is just being a parent. You know, he's just trying to do his job. He's trying to keep his daughter in line. I think this is the thing when when you watch like Little Mermaid and you see anything with like um sort of like more stone fathers you sort of sympathize sympathize with more when you become a parent and it's sort of like you know he's just doing he's trying to be a good parent here but when you're a kid it's sort of like oh they're so me they're not they're holding them back <laughs> but you it's funny funny how your focus shifts when you become a parent i'll tell you <laughs> no, i was uh i was reading through uh, wikipedia before and uh i was i was actually surprised that uh the character of sasuke is based on his own son when he was five and i think that that's pretty interesting considering that you know <laughs> he's not exactly the most uh he, he's he's not the most supportive of his own son's work <laughs> they have a have an interesting relationship mizaki and it's his son the, um certainly there's um there's a documentary on uh, Ozaki where he goes to see his son's an- animation debut, which was Tales of Mercy, and he sort of walks out for the first five minutes and complains that he made it too personal. So, <laughs> yeah, they they it's hard to say what, how their relationship works, especially when he's obviously like throwing like he's basing characters on him, and at the same time he's just very they have a very sort of detached relationship. Well, it's a, I think uh, it's a, you know. Reports. It's like a strict Asian family type of thing, right? I mean, you, okay. you look at Miyazaki, and he is in the older generation, so yeah, so um, like you know, older generation, like maybe like closer to our parents' age. Uh, so as the film obviously goes on, and Ponyo becomes more a uh, human girl form, which also had, demonstrates her ability to make things bigger using her magic. Mm-hmm. Um, so we get to see. Sosuke and Ponyo go 
walking through the flooded village in his pop pop boat, which um, is kind of again just another charming sequence when you see like how the town are all being rescued and they're all having they're all in this uh, parade of boats, which I think was just uh, just kind of like fun to see, and they had this encounter with uh, a young family with uh, the mother and father and they've got a young baby there and Ponyo learns about uh, is trying to give uh, the baby soup and uh, the mother's like no I I have food I produce milk for the baby and then she just like is all like so you make milk and she's like trying to give her sandwiches that she's eating all the ham out of which is kind of nice but kind of off at the same time <laughs> so yeah I there's moments of this film where I was like I was like completely charmed and then other moments where I just like felt like my neighbour Totoro where it was all like I just kind of need some fret here some danger or something to latch onto rather than just overwhelming whimsy which I think this is certainly one which it certainly leans into and we look when we look at the couple of films before this one such as The Spirited Away and um, House Moving Castle they still had that element of danger, even though they were both really sort of heavy on the whimsy side. Um, and I think when you look at Princess Monoki, that like takes it to the utmost extreme, where it's sort of like you've got loads of danger and you've got uh, the fantastical side, and then we have Spirit Away and House of Women Castle, where it's all like dials it back a little to that middle setting. And then when we have uh, Mane Totoro and uh, this this film, it's sort of like when we remove all the danger and just maximize the whimsy. Yeah, but you know, like being a fan of my neighbor Totoro, I I think that it's one of the reasons that every single time I rewatch Ponyo, which isn't very frequent, um, I see something more that I like. Um, perhaps it's the whimsy, perhaps it's the fantasy. There were you know the 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 different uses, the details, because it seems like there's a lot hidden in the movie that as you watch more of it, I feel like there's more to discover and. I don't know. I'm a really basic person. I don't really, you know, like, it's it's so sad to say this. And it's going to be like, yeah, who wants to read her reviews after this? But basically, it's, um, but I think that I feel that, you know, when, when I watch movies now, especially like Miyazaki, it's sometimes like just the details and the feeling that you have, like, it's, this film has some, has kind of like a feel good moment. Like, Neighbor Totoro had like that moment where you got like, kind of, Oh, worried because you know obviously uh, the the little sister disappears and you don't know what happens okay. to mom and you know you have those little emotional moments right, but in this one there is a threat obviously you, we have the tsunami but it it almost feels like an adventure because you know mom is like timing herself to race through the waves to get home and <laughs> and then you know everything's underwater and you're you're just kind of going around and it's like a little adventure and sometimes i think that that's nice i mean i don't i don't ask a lot about my for my for my animated films in general so i think that that's one of the reasons that as i watch this more i feel like little things pop up and it's it gets charming more and more charming every single time it's still the thing is it's still there's there's still so much work that Miyazaki has done that I think is better than this, and that's the only reason why it would be lower on the list. It's not exactly like a horrible movie. It's just kind of more along the lines of average because it it is an interesting take on the Little Mermaid, which is a a story that you know everybody knows. <laughs> um, and in this one, you kind of have this. This 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 other this other version of it, I mean, I mean, say like okay. So when we look at the Little Mermaid, this is something that I just thought of. <laughs> when we look at the okay. Little Mermaid, we have um, I've never read the Hans Christian Andersen one. I only know the Disney version, so I don't know how far apart it is. Um, but so if you think about it, like say when we look at the Disney Little Mermaid, we have the, our main threat is Ursula. And then in this one, if you were to add a danger like Ursula, would that have made it better? I think so. I think the thing, as is such a a great villain, because um, he's one of those charismatic Disney villains, which I think is something that Disney have, have forgotten how to do. When you, she's part of that class of villains, where you look at her and you got Scar. Yeah, she's the, she's like the OG villains of Disney. Yeah, yeah, she's. Um, 
and the fact with uh, Ursa, she's perfectly within her right to be to do what she does because she's just upholding a contract. This is what we all forget as kids. We just like think, oh, Ursula's mean. She's because she does horrible things. But no, just Ursula upholds a bloody contract. That's all Ursula does. Yeah, but then if you think about it, in this one, while Fujimoto is the father, yes, he also kind of has a deal. You know that the the only way he's down here is that he's maintaining the balance, right? Yes, that's right. So he kind of takes on both of those roles at the same time. So he takes the the father's I- role. And it, like Triton's role, and then he takes Ursula's role, and it combines into one person. Yeah. So basically, yeah, if we were to separate those two, like then, because you don't think he's a villain, but in in reality, I think that the point of him is kind of to be a villain. But this is more of I think that the the point of this film is that it's more of like a children's movie, um, because you know obviously the the last movie did so well and Howl's Moving Castle was you know fun and stuff like that and it was very good kind of like children's film that I guess they wanted to take to right something else that was more geared towards kids um and and when you look at this one I definitely can see kids enjoying it a little bit more because it's more adventurous you know you have a younger character that you can kind of relate to um but but with that you know obviously if you're geared towards kids you can't have like hardcore horror <laughs> like hardcore hmm. like villains because then then it becomes a little bit too too creepy <laughs> i think no well for modern modern kids movies you can't but you look at all the kids movies that we sort of grew up yeah. with and the, the the villains didn't hold back they went wholeheartedly into like the villainous uh sides of yeah, things yeah. and because you know we realized that you know Kids, kids don't break when you fall. They sometimes bounce. Yeah. Um, and I think the problem is really because we're looking upon you um, as for the adult eyes and certainly parents' eyes. So you can reason with Ponyo's father and the fact that, you know, he's got a job to do. Yeah. And when you're a kid, you're like, oh, no, he's stopping Ponyo having fun and doing what she wants to do. So she's mean because that's what your parents do. They stop you yeah, doing but, what you want so to do. But... That, that's my point of why this is a kid's movie, because we're looking at w- with with, with <laughs> glasses of being a parent, right? Like, I'm a recent parent, so I can relate to Fujimoto. Like, I don't feel like he's a villain either. But if you were to pick out a villain in this whole thing, it would have to be him. That would be the threat, right? Yeah. To Ponyo. Because if you think about the main threat, the main threat was the tsunami. But the tsunami also created this beauty. It created this underwater beauty that like no one knew existed. All these all these sea creatures that would pop out all of a sudden. So there was like I guess it I don't know, I mean I, I think this film is kind of really feel feel good. There's not really like a whole lot of, um, I like the whimsy. I feel like, I feel like life is, you know, we watch a lot of real things like rooted in reality. And when you jump into Miyazaki, that's what I really love about his world is that, that just not being afraid of, you know, being extremely whimsical and just, just going all out and, and, it's it's why I think we really love the mind of Miyazaki, the things that he writes and and how he's able to recreate certain things. And the same reason, say, that we want to watch, say, you know, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio instead of uh, the Pinocchio by Disney, you know? Yeah. Because it's a different take. It's 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 a different version of what there is. And and I think that that's what makes Ponyo charming. Um as as a whole, obviously, like I, I think there's there's so many things about this that's just so beautiful and so charming, and I feel that when you watch it the first time, you don't really see it as much, and slowly it kind of gets there. At least for me, obviously, that's that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, and certainly when it's it's certainly really because obviously when we look at the tsunami sequence, I mean that happens really because of uh, Ponyo taking the life out of balance but at the same time everything still remains very beautiful it's not this destructive force uh the town floods but nobody dies uh because everyone's on on boats instead of um instead of like you know being trapped at all everyone uh, everyone manages to escape so it's it's sort of because in many ways, I mean, the the tsunami is supposed to be this this horrible sort of destructive force. This is the one thing that uh, Fujimoto doesn't want to happen. I mean, the fact that 
the moon's lowering and this is by Ponyo escaping. And I think his main concern is the fact that Ponyo won't be loved by uh, Sosuke mm-hmm. and that she'll turn into seafoam. Um, if uh, he doesn't, if he doesn't love her, which is a lot of pressure to put on a five-year-old. So, um, but even as I said, even when the tsunami is happened, as I said, he like he saves the old folks so they don't drown. So they're getting to run around that underwater bubble, <laughs> and they seem really happy. Um, I don't understand why they're suddenly able to walk. They're all in wheelchairs. Is it, whether it, is it just like they're re-energized and that they can walk all along like? Um, Grandpa Bucket in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. He was just really lazy. He could, he could actually walk all this time. I don't think so. I think maybe it's just like the, the whole concept of maybe water makes you lighter. I don't know. That was my other thought, really, because this underwater, everything seems to be following the rules of, you know, underwater. But um, at the same time, everyone's really dry. Yeah. So it was it was kind of weird physics that are happening under there. So Yeah, but then but sure. then I think that it's it's more the fact that when they get out of that bubble and they're walking up the stairs to get out, they're like walking, they're like, Oh, we, I'm gonna get you your your sea wheelchairs. We don't need it, type of thing, and then they walk off. <laughs> it's a, it, there's something that don't make sense, but you know. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of like how is everybody so okay with seeing Ponyo, who was originally like a little goldfish that she picked, he picked up, apparently, right? And then all of a yeah. sudden, we're like, "Oh, she comes back as a little girl," and everyone's okay with it, you know? People are very accepting of weird things in the world of Miyazaki, though, aren't they? <laughs> well, just the, with the studio Ghibli world as a whole, that they're, they're very accepting of like the most fantastical things. They just sort of accept them as being fact. We look at Spirited Away. There's so many elements of like the spirit world that uh, she's willing to accept very early on um, <laughs> before it uh, before things start uh, going like full on weird. She's still sort of, like um, it's sort of, like oh this is just what they are. And even like in House Moving Castle, a world where we know that she knows there's a wizard who has a moving castle, and she's still just mildly surprised by the fantastical elements such as like the fire sprite which powers the castle. And threatens to burn your bacon. <laughs> yeah. I think if we were to do a draft of like favorite uh, Ghibli characters, I think he would certainly be up there in mine. Yes. It's always yes. like the, the my one big takeaway. Maybe that's what we're doing towards the end of the season. We draft our favorite Ghibli yeah, characters. Yeah, like our, our, like. our season special. <laughs> there we go. You heard it here. Um, but have you anything else you want to talk about on this one? No, that's it. Uh, one last thing I want to say is, um, where did um, Sasuke's mother learn to drive? Because there's scenes where, like at the start, where she's trying to look at ice cream, but she chooses to do it right on a corner. And there's other moments where she's like drifting around the side of the mountain. It's sort of like she has the most extreme way of driving this tiny car. Um, she has like no regard for anyone else's safety on this road and it was just kind of funny when she's there like almost crowing off the cliff at any given moment <laughs> um and the other sequence i really love as well is the scene when they're being sort of chased by the waves and it's just basically ponyo riding on her sisters who take the form of giant fish and you see her like running on top of the waves i thought that was such a a charming little sequence. Uh, even though it's bizarre, the fact that Sasuke and his mother stop in the middle of a tsunami to <laughs> go up over the side of the cliff. So. Well, I mean, would you if you were if someone was like, "Oh, I'm seeing a little girl outside." <laughs> you know? Nope, she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a tsunami. It's not going to end well. <laughs> My car is not a submarine, <laughs> so. I would not say, I don't think I would have stopped. I mean, obviously, you clearly shown you would because you're clearly a nicer person than me, Kim. So. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we actually, if we ever experience it, then I'll tell you. But I hope we never do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be worried if, uh, if we encounter flood waters where I am because we're at the top of a hill. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be concerned if the water makes it up this high. I was surprisingly enjoyed this more than I remember liking it the last time I watched this. Maybe I was just in the mood for something whimsical this time, but um certainly it's not it's not one that's gonna break the uh 
the top t- the top ten of like the Studio Ghibli movies to myself, but it's certainly better than a lot of the output of this era, like Ariate and uh, definitely Tales of Mercy, um, which is just awful. But um, at the same time, I think it it deserves a little more respect, much like The Cat Returns. I think it's the fact that they're all on Netflix here in the UK though anyway um, I think it's definitely one worth uh, giving giving a look at it's sort of like one of those overlooked entries um, not only in the Murzaki filmography but the Studio Ghibli filmography as well I think um, it's definitely one that's worth giving another look at least so that brings us into tonight's show thank you as always for listening if you haven't done already please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to be listening to us uh, you can check out our blog which is moose and tea podcast at wordpress.com you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Come say hi to us there. And wherever you happen to listen to us, do hit the like and subscribe button. Leave us a review. Let us know what you think of the show, as it all helps raise the profile of the show as well. But, uh, Kim, season end. Next episode, where are we going to? Yes, we are going to watch um, the 2013, his uh, supposed last film before his retirement um the wind rises if it was spent as his uh, retirement film he goes all out by looking at the history of japanese aviation so that is uh, obviously coming up on our next episode but until then thank you for listening thanks to my co-host kim and uh, we'll be back next time to talk about the wind rises but until then good night <laughs>